welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Badram Mizani. I'm the founding president of AC Medical, and uh, you're you're here for our 2024 MASH webinar series. Uh, we're going to do our best to provide you weekly webinars on the most important components of your residency application, and this includes both uh, uh, ERAS, NRMP, and for those of you participating in ophthalmology through SF Match, we're going to provide you some updates there as well. Really excited to be here. You know, I want to uh, welcome all of you, all of our new members as well. And uh, so with no further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Small housekeeping items. You know, I want to make sure that you take a look at our new residency prep uh, academy. And that's where you can also uh, register for upcoming webinars. That's where you went to register for this particular webinar. We're always updating information there. So please take a look at it and take advantage of it. Again, it's completely free to you. Another free resource that we have available is our um, Future Docs podcast which we also create a video version of it as well, which we call vodcast. And we, uh, we uh, post uh, weekly episodes there as well. AC Medical videos are also an incredible resource for those of you that uh, can't reach us all the time, and, and, but you're looking to see what our thoughts are on key topics such as letters of recommendation and medical student performance evaluation. And, and uh, we try not to just give you cookie cutter answers, but really present to you some of the solutions that we've uh, provided to some of the tougher challenges that our members have had and we've been able to uh, help them succeed and uh, survive through it. So please take a look at those videos. And as you see here today, we're gonna be uh, posting this recording as well in a YouTube world premiere format. So if you don't get to watch it right now, wait for the YouTube world premiere, we're gonna invite you uh, and you can come over there and we can live chat with me and uh, watch the edited version of this video. Now, the only way that we can go ahead and invite you is if you are subscribing to our YouTube channel. So please make sure you go to youtube.com forward slash AC Medical Org and uh, you can subscribe there and uh, get uh, updates every time that we share it with our subscribers. If you're not a member with us yet, please make sure you try us out for free. Uh, you can sign up to either consult with our enrollment consultants or you can meet with me. It takes a little bit longer to meet with me. And so if your issue is urgent, please make sure that you um, work with our enrollment consultants. And, but otherwise you can, of course, meet with me as well. And it's free, the consult is free. So take advantage of it. Every year we celebrate our, our members and their interviews and their matches. And uh, we give away five $100 Amazon gift cards. And uh, this year is no exception. And so the entry deadline for all of the AC Medical uh, members uh, we do cross-reference that you do need to log in and you must have been an AC Medical member in the past to qualify when you log in. It's going to be April 25th, 2023 at 11 a.m. And then soon we're going to have the drawing right after that, which we're going to post it live on YouTube as well. So can't wait to give those uh, you know gift cards uh, to our AC Medical members who succeeded and got into residency. Saving money is important. This is a, this is a big marathon that you're all a part of. And so we you know, this year we're offering four complete prep packages. And so if you look to enroll either by the number of letters of recommendation that you need, uh, if you have a specific budget, if you're looking for a particular residency affiliation, or if you want to stay local to a, a, a geographical area, um, we have complete prep packages um, based on those. And, uh, you know, right now until uh, March 30th, we're offering $1,000 off of every $5,000 uh, increment per invoice. And you also get your free membership. The more weeks that you enroll with us, the, the higher the level of membership that you would get for free. And so take a look at the promo page and, and take advantage of it. So this is our 2024 match uh, webinar series. Uh, this is the first webinar of, uh, of the entire series. And uh, originally we were going to cover the 10 steps into preparing for the match and discuss changes, but the changes were so much that we decided to separate those two uh, webinars. And so today's webinar is going to be on new changes and updates in my ERAS, NRMP, SF Match, and a few other organizations that are key players. Before we begin, uh, it's really, really important that, uh, that I provide you this disclaimer that test names, trademarks, such as ACGME, ERAS, ECFMG, NRMP, um, MSVE, AMA, any um, abbreviations or full names of organizations that you see are the properties of their respective trademark holders and they're not affiliated with AC Medical or Mayor Clerkship's Medical Society. We've done our best uh, to provide you reliable information, uh, but they are simply our opinions and we strongly recommend that you also do your own uh, research and uh, as this information can change uh, at any time. As exemplified today, uh, I thought I had the whole webinar ready and then um, ERS uh, provided some additional uh, changes. So 
Um, and also keep in mind that if you have any red flags in your residency application, such as your USMLE or complex uh, failures, if you've had gaps during medical school or afterwards, uh, if you've had unsuccessful previous matches, you know, we strongly recommend that you seek uh, expert advice to, um, to, to address these issues. Uh, and, uh, and, and the advice should come from individuals that keep themselves up to date on the latest when it comes to residency match, and they have expertise in your particular uh, background and, and medical education and how to help you. Uh, so for example, a US medical school advisor or somebody who's, um, you know, who is uh, an ophthalmologist, it's gonna be very hard for that individual to provide guidance to an international medical graduate who is applying to family medicine. Uh, so keep those things in mind. And again, take advantage of our trials for free offer that we have for you. The following are updates from uh, ECFMG, of course, ECFMG's Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates. And uh, ever since uh, COVID began and the uh, clinical skills examination was stopped, ECFMG had started, uh, you know, they had to figure out a way to, uh, to be able to fulfill the clinical and communication skills requirement for ECFMG certification. And so they did that through pathways as well as uh, OET. And so the application process for 2024 match is going to start in the towards the late portion of second quarter of 2023. So that'll be April, May, June. So probably sometime in June, you can go ahead and start applying for uh, the six pathways. And this is the time if you were rejected for 2023 uh, pathways, then you can apply for 2024. So the changes that we're seeing are in, in across all six pathways. In pathway one, they're requiring that you have had an unrestricted license since January 1, 2019. Again, this applies to international medical graduates only who do not have an ECFMG and an unrestricted ECFMG certification. Pathways two to five requires that you've graduated on or after January 1, 2022. So that's another change. Pathway six, there are some minor changes in the way that the evaluators are supposed to process um, the evaluation form on the mini CEX. So nothing major from a candidate's perspective. And the cost is still the same, $925 for this pathway. This is a big deal, 2024 accreditation by ECFMG. And uh, this was postponed by one year because of COVID. And uh, the idea is, and continues to be, that starting in 2024, ECFMG will begin implementation of the ECFMG recognized accreditation policy. And um, the idea here is that you must have graduated from a, an accredited medical school in order to qualify for ECFMG certification. That was the, the entire premise of it. And the changes have been staggering. Uh, so 2024 is next year and it's coming down. And a lot of uh, medical education across the world has, has been improved as a result of this. But the, the one concern that we all had is if this is going to go into effect in 2024, does that mean that if your medical school you graduated from, if it's not accredited or if it's not recognized by an ECFMG recognized accreditation entity, will that impact your ability to secure an ECFMG certification? And we just, we're seeing that the, uh, the initial implementation of it will involve reporting whether the medical school is recognized by accreditation status, and it will not impact the ECFMG uh, certification eligibility of an individual, which is a big, big sigh of relief because uh, some of the uh, some of the countries uh, that we have uh, that we import uh, the greatest number of physicians from such as india uh, their accrediting bodies have yet to be uh, recognized and hopefully that's going to change soon and this information is very fast moving so please make sure that you go to ecfmg.org forward slash accreditation for the latest updates but as it as of now um, it should not impact your ability to secure an ecfmg certification the Coalition for Physician Accountability, this came on our radar during the pandemic, and uh, but the, the process, this project had started before the pandemic. And the issue was that there were significant breaking points in the undergraduate medical education to graduate medical education transition, uh, mainly of US medical seniors, but of course it impacts everyone, internationals and US. And so in August of 2021, they came with a draft final recommendation of uh, 34 major recommendations by the Coalition for Physician Accountability, which includes uh, all of the major players, uh, NRMP, ECFMG, uh, uh, program director societies, uh, medical societies, uh, everyone you could imagine. And so they came up with 34 major recommendations. And these recommendations are incredible. They're incredible. And they're very applicant facing. 
And so they're they're protecting um, uh, us. And, and for that, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate what they've done. And so initially there was a lot of concern whether these recommendations are going to be followed. Um, but you'll see in just a moment that uh, that uh, the, this effort, uh, you know, almost five years did not go to waste. And so I recommend everyone, if it's, it's 270 pages, you, you don't have to read the whole thing, but at least I want you to take a look at the 34 major recommendations. That's not, that's not, that's, that's less than 10 pages. So take a look at those recommendations and the reasons behind it. And, and one of them that is directly going to impact you is the recommendation to do away with letters of recommendation altogether and instead replace it with structured level letters of evaluation, which is, for example, um, emergency medicine has been doing for you know over 40 years. And uh, we did a webinar on um, SLEs versus SLOs versus LORs, or LORs out of uh, you know out of the window. Uh, we did a webinar on this uh, just last year, so I recommend that you take a look at that. You go to our YouTube channel and you look for the playlist for U.S. Letters of Recommendation, and it should be number one or number two on uh, that playlist. So take a look at that. So LORs are not out the window. However, and 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 what happened is we kind of tested that last year just a little bit when when the Coalition for Physician Accountability started saying, hey, listen, we we need something more ACGME core competency based. So we tested it out, and a lot of physicians um, did just didn't know how to complete a structured letter of evaluation like that. But Internal Medicine, the Society for General Internal Medicine, has already taken a huge leap forward, and uh, they've already made a statement that one of the letters of recommendation must be uh, structured, and uh, and they also provided some feedback on how that could be done. So take a look at this, and you know we're going to have additional. Uh, we're going to have one of the match series. A 2024 match uh, webinar series on letters of recommendation. We're going to have a lot more information on that for you there. So with that, here are some updates from NRMP. NRMP in response to, um, you know, initially in response to uh, this report, uh, they said, okay, well, you know what, let's go ahead and do it with SOAP. And instead, we're going to have two phase match. And so there will be two rank order lists submitted by the programs, and there'll be more time to holistically review the candidates and, and they opened it up for public comments and that was rejected. So that did not work. So next they came up with uh, voluntary locking functionality for program rank order list. And one of the recommendations made by the coalition for physician accountability was that, look, um, if you don't, if you have a rank order list that you have not finalized yet and, and candidates are still coming to your program and, and they're asking you questions, especially towards the end of rank order list uh, uh, certification, you're going to have an opportunity to go ahead and put them lower on your rank order list. And so that visit, that second or third look visit by a candidate to your program um, could actually hurt them uh, significantly. And so NRMP, to address this perceived barrier, and uh, certainly by the by, by uh, COPA uh, and other organizations, they said, okay, so if the two-phase uh, matching did not, did not get approved, what about staggered rank order list certification deadlines? And, um, and so you would have programs certifying their rank order list two weeks, that's the proposed date, uh, before applicants rank order list certification. And so the applicants could visit the programs that they're interested in and they engage with meaningful assessment of that program and culture without the concern that that program is going to make any changes in their rank order list. And this is being considered, uh, you know, we don't know if this is gonna be approved, but, but keep an eye out on this one and, and follow the progress on, on NRMP's website. This actually happened to one of our members uh, this this soap and so um, you know she was soap eligible, and uh, and then right before soap uh, NRMP made her soap ineligible, and in 2023 the match day for CARMS was after soap, and so NRMP couldn't let candidates uh, who had participated in CARMS participate in soap because they didn't want there to be a match through a supplemental offer and acceptance program, and then they would have another match through CARMS. So. Uh, they implemented their uh, their policy, which they've already stated it in their terms of use, uh, and they said that you cannot participate in both, and therefore they withdrew um, a member from sub supplemental offer and acceptance program. So that was quite a quite a shocker to her. Uh, but again, this was something that was disclosed. Now, so the question that we had was, you know, does that what about SF match uh, and the San Francisco match ophthalmology? So some, can someone be in? And NRMP's main match and at the same time be an SF match. So I did speak with NRMP and uh, they said that you can be in both because you need, you know, you need the transitional year for uh, ophthalmology, for example, 
However, uh, that does not stop somebody from applying to internal medicine categorical. So I'm not sure what kind of, um, um, you know, if, again, what I mean by that is internal medicine categorical through NRMP and ophthalmology at the same time uh, through SF match. But it appears that NRMP and is, is more concerned about when the match date is for, for each one of these respective organizations. And so SF match uh, as an early match, which occurs in January, obviously NRMP occurs in March. Uh, so there's no conflict with those dates, and and they um, they didn't uh, indicate to me that they're going to withdraw that individual. But again, you have to make sure that you you check for yourself and make sure that you don't fall in a situation uh, like this. And these are these are highly fluid situations. Updates from ERAPS. This was uh, this was uh, quite interesting. So there are major changes to uh, the experiences sections for for any of you who participated in. Uh, have used my ERAS in the past, the experiences are, are three components. And, and, and actually, before I, I go there, there's supplemental ERAS. And supplemental ERAS, they're, they're, not, they're not expecting any major changes there. Uh, but supplemental ERAS is now accepted by 15 specialties. Fam family medicine was not one of them, but they are considering it. Uh, this year in, um, in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in a family medicine program director seminar, uh, they did consider it and they did have a discussion about uh, supplemental ERAS and whether family medicine should participate in it. Uh, and so, you know, keep your eye out uh, for, for, for family medicine as well. But FM in 2023 match, you didn't have to submit a supplemental ERAS. Uh, if there is a change there, then, then certainly we're going to do a supplemental ERAS uh, webinar and we'll include that uh, in, as a part of our 2024 uh, match webinar series. But the idea is that there's a, uh, you know, there was some overlap, but not much. In 2023, my ERAS application, which they call main ERAS application, and the supplemental ERAS application. Supplemental ERAS is available for a very short period of time, um, you know, about uh, about two to three weeks. We don't know what the duration is going to be this year, and you have to complete it. If well, you don't have to; it's, it's voluntary. But we recommend that you strongly that you com complete it and you submit it before its deadline. And when you do that, both the supplemental and your application will be downloaded at the same time. Um, by the programs. And so um, the supplemental was just a lot more detailed, right? Provide a lot more options. Uh, and uh, and it, it took a long time to complete. And, and so there's no changes there per ERAS uh, with regards to supplemental ERAS. But what they've done is they've taken some of the components of supplemental ERAS and they've incorporated it into main ERAS applications. So let's take a look. So the major changes are to the experiences sections. And there are three experiences sections, uh, not three, <laughs> three experiences sections. And these experience sections are work, volunteer, and research. We used to be able to in, in, incorporate, you know, an unlimited number of, of experience sections. And we discourage people from doing that uh, because, you know, a lot of times uh, you know, we would see 15, 20 work experiences and equal number of volunteer experiences. Like, you know, for every hour that somebody did something, they would just, they would go ahead and include it. And it just became very cumbersome to look at this application. The idea is, you know, we have to make a decision when we look at your application within, you know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds max. And so that was very counterproductive to have so many experiences. It would just, we, we couldn't make sense of it. And so for AC medical members, we limited um, those members to 15. We said no more than five entries for work, volunteer and research. So that's 15 total. Well, um, this year, uh, ERAS took it even a step further. They said, you know what? You can only include up to 10 experiences. So max is three, right? And you can self-select the top three of those experiences as meaningful, uh, most meaningful experiences for yourself. And on the description portion of my ERAS application, we used to be only able to, you know, include whatever we want. It was a plain text field. We could type whatever we want. Um, but now there's a lot more uh, descriptive information that's being collected about each experience that you've entered. Your position, organization, uh, time frame, um, you know, was it once, uh, one time, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually? Because some of these experiences we would, uh, you know, our, our members would uh, go there uh, and they would say, you know, 20 hours a week for the past five years. And uh, that just didn't make any sense because they did so many other things during that time period as well. And so hopefully when we see my ERAS application, when it opens up uh, starting June, then we'll be able to see uh, what changes have been implemented. But definitely it's going to be different than the 2023 application that we and, and for decades that we've been used to. Um, so major changes here. Other changes to the experiences sections, you can better define it as uh, whether this was volunteer, uh, work, professional or hobby. 
right? So no longer just three, it's gonna be now increased to five. And it will help the programs categorize them better as they're looking at the application, right? So they won't have to figure it out. The whole name of the game is, the program shouldn't have to figure things out, right? It should be very easy for them to come to their own conclusions and whatever floats their boat. If they like it, great. If they don't, they can move on to the next application. And then uh, there is another option to offer additional multiple entry questions to caption the mission focus characteristic of each one of the experiences, such as whether this was in rural, suburban, urban area. And again, it helps the program have a much more holistic approach to your residency application. And this holistic review of applications started when step one and step two scores came under significant scrutiny when they found out that, you know, the uh, um, uh, National Board of Medical Examiners and, and, and a lot of other organizations found out that these scores were being used by residency programs to select program, uh, select candidates uh, for their program. And that was not the intent at all. Um, and that was very stressful for candidates, right? And so they push for holistic review. That the holistic review is fantastic, and it's very easy to do. We we used to do it all the time. The problem is a lot of residency programs they don't like to uh, invest in the human resources necessary to to really truly vet all these applications. It takes a lot of training to do, and so they have one person, maybe a coordinator, maybe the program director selects all the applicants. And they don't have time, right? They have their regular work that they have to do throughout the day. And then now you give them 2000 applications, they got to figure out. And these applications are, are all over the place. So they, they look for these standardized screening tools. And, but, but those are, they're, they're very, very frowned upon now. Uh, so step one, that's the reason why step one became pass fail. And then hopefully step two CK is going to become pass fail soon also. Um, no, no indication of that yet, but, but, you know, stay tuned. I'm, I, you can probably mark my words. Step two CK is going to become pass fail soon because um you know step one became pass fail now programs are looking at step two ck score and again that is counter to what the the the, the spirit of, of holistic review is anyways uh the rural suburban urban your supplemental eras application pass fail on on step one it's all all of these are meant to um, lessen the stress as you transition into graduate medical education which is residency Finally, the other changes to experiences sections includes a short description on the critical information for the program responsibilities and the context for all of the experience entries. So the more I looked at this, the more this seemed like the supplemental ERAS application. So I wouldn't be surprised if supplemental ERAS application kind of shrinks a little bit, even though they didn't mention any changes to supplemental ERAS. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it kind of shrinks and this kind of expands. Now, take a look at this part. There's a portion, uh, again, if you haven't participated in, in the match before in, in my ERAS in application, uh, there's a, at the end, there's this little spot, uh, which is, which just says uh, hometown. And this used to be a, you know, plain text entry. You could enter whatever you want. And so uh, what this is going to do is that it's going to use a standardized field to collect all the location information across the entire application. So postal code, setting, country, state, city, uh, including the hometown and addresses for experiences and education. Pretty interesting. So wherever you put all of your experiences, theoretically, it's going to collect all that and start saying, "Hey, these are all the places this individual has been." You know, that's um, so you gotta you gotta really pay attention to what you put in these experiences. Uh, again, we're we're all up for it, but um, it, it holds you to a whole different level of standard because you gotta be very careful in in, in what experiences you put in, and they all gotta be true and meaningful. Now, the part that we marked in red. It provides you the option to share your geographic preferences with the programs. The new questions will capture applicants' preferences for different regions of the United States and their setting preferences. This is generally a good thing. And the way that they implemented it in supplemental ERAS was a really good way to do it. So, for example, if you said that I want the Pacific, you know, Northwest region, uh, you know, if, if that's my preferred region, or, uh, or the Atlantic is my preferred region. Uh, program directors that were not in those regions would not see your, uh, your geographical uh, preference. They wouldn't see it. This is in your ERAS application. So when we ask the question to ERAS whether this is going to be omitted uh, and not shown, this is going to be hidden to programs that are not in those regions, they did not have an answer for us. So we marked it as red. I want you to keep an eye on this and uh, just don't have hazardly say what your geographical preference is. If it is not going to be hidden, 
uh, from programs that are not in those regions. Because you know, if I'm a program in New York and you said that I want to be in Florida, why would I want to give you an interview if you clearly tell me you don't want to come to New York? Why? Because you said you want to be in Florida. That's what your geographical preference is. So keep an eye out for this and, and make sure that it doesn't backfire. Uh, SF match. Now this, of course, this doesn't apply to everyone, uh, but we do have a few of our members that uh, uh, that are participating in the ophthalmology residency match, and and you know some of the changes here again, it doesn't apply to all of you, but we we got to make sure that we include this because we do have a few members, as I mentioned. So ACGME mandated a four-year training uh, requirement. Uh, sorry for the misspelling for ophthalmology residents to include a PGY one as early as 2020, and so. And and all of the programs must include a PGY-1 by 2023, this year. Uh, and so there were two types. There was a PGY-1 to 4 integrated, which was all through San Francisco match, SF match. So no NRMP required. And then there is the PGY-2 to 4 through SF match supplemented by a PGY-1 through NRMP match for joint programs, right? So you would still apply through NRMP and, um, uh, and SF match, but the your original for PGY-1, their match would have to come from NRMP. Uh, so in 2024, theoretically, all the ophthalmology programs must offer PGY-1, so no more need for transition a year. However, when I spoke with NRMP today, they said that not all the ophthalmology programs are offering a PGY-1 yet. So this uh, threw a, a bit of a kink into, um, into the mix. So if those of you who are thinking about ophthalmology, you gotta, you gotta still consider preparing your application for transitional, which is like, you know, for PGY-1 only through NRMP, which means you have to have clinical experiences for that transitional year, and you have to have letters of recommendation for that, as well as your PGY-2 to 4 through SF match for ophthalmology, which means letters of recommendation for ophthalmology, clinical experiences for ophthalmology, and going through two matches simultaneously. So that's, uh, um, I, 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 you know, I was, I was a little bit disappointed to hear that there's still programs out there that don't offer PGY-1 yet in ophthalmology. The other thing that was, um, interesting is that for ophthalmology they are fully implementing this altus uh, assessments and uh this is casper right we saw casper a lot uh in the beginning of the pandemic and the 2021 match a lot of programs started uh, requesting this before you know before they would consider your application kind of like a pre-application but ophthalmology requires three, Casper, Duet, and Snapshot. I'm not fully familiar with all of these. If you have any questions with these, go to this website that they provided us. Take altus.com for details. Again, we're not affiliated with them. These are just the requirements for ophthalmology. All right, so these are the major changes that uh, we've noted for the 2024 match. And uh, you know, I'd like to go through the registration uh, page and we'll take a look at some of your questions and let's go ahead and provide uh, some answers to you. If you do have any questions right now, you can also raise your hand and I'll be more than happy to um, uh, unmute you. And well, you'll, you'll unmute yourself, but I would love to speak with you as well. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask me and we'll have a conversation. All right, we have a question. Could you speak more about the internal medicine LOR that you were saying would be specific uh, this year? Um, sure, I can take you to that page. Okay, so this is the uh, the Alliance for uh, Academic Internal Medicine, and uh, they want a structured evaluation letter. And so this was updated in July 2022, and uh, so this was really for last match cycle. And they provide you a um, an SEL template and, and a mock-up. And there's some instructions uh, for international medical uh, graduates uh, as well. And so let's go ahead and take a look at this, for example, FAQ for IMGs and FAQs. And so the idea here is that, uh, you know, program directors were complaining that these letters of recommendation that we're receiving from candidates are too generic. They're not helping us. They're not helping us identify whether this individual is going to be uh, qualified for PGY-1 or not. We can't tell whether uh, the letter writer is U.S. or international. We can't tell uh, whether, you know, how familiar these individuals are with ACGME core competencies. And so they said, look, why don't we... Um, consider a structured evaluative uh, letter and, uh, and and see if we can change things up. And so let me see if there's a the template over here can make sense. So, you know, it asks, you know, it, it's almost like a mini medical student performance evaluation. It's huge. And so there's a lot of questions that they got to answer. And so it talks about, you know, who's the primary evaluator? Uh, what is the information about that individual? What is the nature of the contact? Um, you know, what are the dates, description of the rotation? Was it core or sub I? the COVID impacted, uh, what is a qualification uh, for internal medicine? And they want the ACGME internal medicine milestones and its subcompetencies 
uh, to discuss. And, and if you notice, these are all your ACGME core competencies, patient care, for example, uh, an outpatient, inpatient settings, uh, critical care settings. Uh, they want to discuss your teamwork and accountability, communication, commitment to personal growth, and, and if there's any written comments, and they want to have a statement of uh, letter preparation, and they want to know who this individual is uh, and why are they uh, drafting this letter. And so this is the, uh, you know, the structured evaluative letter uh, that, uh, you know, their, their, uh, the recommendation is, is one of your letters be a structured evaluative letter. When you look at the FAQ for IMGs, I'm assuming that, that a lot of our participants here are IMGs. There is a part that says who can complete the IMSEL. For international graduates, IMSEL authorship or responsibility will need to be adapted to uh, the individual or institution process. Details of the authorship should be indicated in the IMSEL section and uh, is intended to replace the chair departmental letter and can also replace the standard letter of recommendation. Uh, as above, it is not meant for to replace all the letters of recommendation and the SEO should be uploaded in place of a chair or departmental letter if the residency program requires or encourages the Department of Medicine DOM letter. Um, the, the challenge that you're going to face with this, again, we're going to cover all of these in our in our uh, 2024 match webinar series for letters of recommendation. The, the challenge is that some of uh, our international colleagues are going to go in and Get the uh, get a, get an international doctor to to draft this, and again that 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 defeats the purpose of of a structured evaluative letter. It should be from a uh, U.S. attending physician and from your U.S. clinical experiences. All right, so I hope that that answered your question. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of your. All right, so we have another question. The next question is from Doctor. DG, I Doctor Mazani, I'm an IMG who graduated in 2000. I think uh, the only pathway I'm eligible for is Path 26. Um, that uh, seems to be the case, uh, you know. So uh, you're you gotta you gotta find the physician that would or, or multiple physicians to evaluate you on on six uh, cases through mini CEX. If you need assistance with that, please go ahead and contact us. We do have uh, you know we do have a lot of experience with with our affiliate attendings that have uh, helped out with this. And uh, the KR, uh, thank you for the presentation. You're very welcome. Uh, could you tell me uh, what is more valuable? LOR from in-person rotation or an online rotation in 2024 match and how much is the difference? How much is it? I don't understand the question about how much is the difference, but the difference in letters of recommendation between in-person and, uh, and a tele-rotation. Um, you know, in-person rotation, uh, you know, it, it's it's always superior to a tele-rotation. A tele-rotation is not meant to, uh, to replace all of your clinical uh, experiences, although I've seen uh, our members that have matched uh, with with all just tele rotations, but I think that those are uh, those are more exceptions than than the than the norm. So uh, if you absolutely cannot get to the United States, then then of course uh, tele rotation is is the way to go. Now the challenge that you're going to face is the uh, the writers are going to have a tough time um, making a tele rotation. Uh, you know, pointing out areas that are residency relevant, and so uh, that's why we have LOR analysis. Uh, as a part of uh, certain memberships uh, of ours, and so if you do have a membership that is, uh, you know, that has letter of recommendation analysis, that of course, uh, you know, you can upload their letter of recommendation. Don't waive your right to see it. Uh, you, you, whoever knows me, you, you all know that my my recommendation is for you to not waive your right to see your letters of recommendation. I really don't care what what anyone says. Uh, you know, we've seen some tragic stories with letters of recommendation that have been waived. And so we don't recommend that you waive your right to see letter of recommendation if you can help it. So uh, anyways, I digress. But uh, yeah, so tele-rotation letters are tougher to write and, and you need a lot more mentorship in making sure that the letter is is uh, is uh, uh, up to date and, uh, and, and residency relevant and it fits the Coalition for Physician Accountability's uh, uh, recommendation for you know, having something that is a lot more structured. Uh, so we'll, you know, the the the, the jury's out on 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 what's going to happen to LORs, but it's certainly going to impact uh, tele rotation and and in person uh, letters of recommendation. And again, I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean by the how much is the difference. Uh, all the clinical rotations, they're they're the same cost. If if that's what you're asking with regards to the weekly fees, uh, whether it's in person or 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 live online, uh, if it's offered, if both of them are offered by a particular clinical site, they're they're the same. Uh, cost, but there are less and less tele rotations, though. Just so that you know, there's a lot more in person now, and so tele rotations are kind of, you know, they're not your primary uh, option. Dr. S. F. Uh, would you recommend to ask a structured letter of recommendation from attendings instead? Then uh, would it be more beneficial? You know, um, physicians, I don't think they're gonna, they're gonna, they're, I don't think they're gonna like putting the time into drafting an SEL. 
So this is probably something that you're going to have to help them out with, and you're going to have to ask them, uh, have a frank conversation with them. Uh, you know, this is brand new. I know this is going to take you a long time. You know, can I work with your, uh, you know, maybe one of your residents or maybe uh, your medical assistant or your office manager, whoever is going to be doing this. Uh, can I kind of help them with putting it together if if they if they show resistance? But I think that it's a really good idea to have one SEL. I just, you know, it's just so new. Last year, there was a lot of pushback. We tried it, you know, a couple of times and and the letter just didn't even get signed. You know, it just, they they didn't know what to do with it. It's just, it was like deer in a headlight. Um, and so we we stopped producing SELs and then this statement has not changed. So, you know, just be very careful when you make such a demand because, you know, it's already tough enough for these physicians to even give you a generic letter of recommendation. Uh, you know, they, they already put up a little bit of a fight and regardless, AC Medical or whoever it is, even a US medical student, just physicians don't have the time to draft these letters. Um, and so you, you have to get creative and, and, and begin earning it from day one, which again, once you become a member of AC Medical, we'll, we'll put you through those type of trainings. But, you know, just be very careful in, in putting such a demand uh, on, on an attending physician. You're going to risk um, upsetting them. Uh, because this is a, it's a pretty big document. And I think that that's one of the biggest, uh, until, unless it becomes a system wide change, uh, this, the standard letters of recommendation are, are, are here to stay unless it becomes a system wide change, which I wouldn't be surprised if it does, but entire specialty societies have to take the stance that look, this is what we need. You need to provide at a minimum, this is required. And this is what you have to kind of like what emergency medicine did. And then everybody's going to comply. But at this point, no. Uh, if you have any questions with regards to pathways, please go ahead and contact ECFMG. There's a lot more to which pathway you qualify for than just you know your year of graduation. You know, there's just uh, a lot more uh, in your history that that ECFMG takes into consideration. So please contact them uh, and and ask them. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of your questions. All right, so uh, we have a question that said, how to increase my chances of matching in this upcoming cycle if they graduated more than 10 years ago? Great question. Uh, I think that number one, make sure that you you attend all of these webinars and we're going to go step by step. And uh, uh, but, but most importantly, look, it's, it's more than just you being 10 years from from graduating from medical school. It's what you've been doing and especially what have you been doing in the year before uh, you apply to residency and then what are you doing during the application cycle? Uh, take take advantage of, of trials for free so at least we can take a look at your entire application and provide you meaningful advice and, and what we can do to help. But there's a lot that we can do, um, it, it's starting with the way that you are presenting yourself on your application and, and whether there are any grammatical errors in your application if you're a match reapplicant and you know, where are these clinical experiences coming from and how are you describing all these? Or maybe you got a bunch of interviews, you just don't interview well, who knows? We gotta, we gotta figure that out when, when we meet with you. So we gotta isolate the problem and just you being 10 years uh, since graduation is not, is not enough. There's a lot more to it than that. Next question is in uh, ERAS portal, where do I attach the ECFMG extension letter if it was certified in 2021 and they extended it until December 2024? There is no place uh, as a 2023 match. There's no place for you to uh, attach that as a, as a supplement. It's unnecessary. That's going to be a part of your transcript. If you release your transcript to programs, then it's going to be included in that. Now, if there is an, an update to your transcript and, and the program is already downloaded, your previous transcript, then maybe it's not in there but there's not a particular spot you can do. Um, you know, somebody may tell you to go ahead and upload it as a letter of recommendation. I certainly would not do that. I think that's a terrible idea if anybody tells you to do that. Uh, your letters of recommendation are far more superior than an extension on, a, on an ECFMG certification because the assumption is already made that you're ECFMG certifiable if you've made it to a certain um, you know, level of the match process. So for example, if you're SOAP eligible, you don't have to have your ECFMG certification there. ERAS and ECFMG, they communicate with one another and ECFMG will say, look, this individual is ERAS certifiable, meaning their, their pathways are certified. They got OET done. They they passed up one and two CK and, and they just don't have the ECFMG certification in hand, but they will. It's just a matter of them applying to it. So um, the extension I'm not worried about uh, because it's, it's you know, programs will see it or not. And they're, they're already, they're going to assume that you're going to be ECFMG certified. What they're going to look for is your passing of step one and two CK. M most of them are not even used to OET yet, but they'll look for passing a step one and two CK. And they're not going to care much about the score. I'm going to stand corrected on that. Some will, but majority will care whether you pass it on the first attempt. Failing a USMLE is a lot worse than getting a high score. 
uh, on a second attempt uh, on a, on a on an exam. So pass it on the first attempt. I'm not worried about your scores. You know, we can make that up in so many other ways. We just want to make sure you pass it on the first attempt. And if you didn't pass it on the first attempt, that's okay. There's ways that we deal with that uh, as well. We have we have a lot of our members that have passed it like a third and fourth attempt. And they still got interviews and they match in this match cycle. So make sure you take advantage of of our um, again tries for free consult. Uh, how to get um, e slow uh, for emergency medicine? Uh, sign up for a clinical with us. Uh, we right now uh, for the months of April, May, and June, we have only a three month uh, availability uh, in in a teaching hospital with emergency medicine uh, department. Um, that uh, that historically those uh, the emergency directors have uh, have drafted um, a slow. Now there's different versions of slow. I think there's four different types. And they they do uh, one of those types, and you can you can upload those. Uh, and emergency medicine, it's a interesting choice that you bring that up. I'm not sure if you're a U.S. or intern. Okay, so you're you're a Caribbean uh, grad, yeah. So emergency medicine has been having a, a quite a tough time, as you all know, uh, with the unfilled spots. Uh, but I'm not sure if they'll change their behavior. Um, I'm not sure if they'll change your, uh, their behavior in 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 considering international medical graduate uh, applicants. Uh, they certainly didn't. In the 2023, they still ignored a lot of the IMG candidates. Uh, maybe 2024 match, they'll change, and and a lot more IMGs will get in there. I, I do want to uh, bring up a, a change that that I've also noticed in in family medicine. Uh, there are less international medical graduates in family medicine that I've ever seen before, uh, and this was published in Frida. And so in 2021, uh, only 28 percent of uh, residency programs had international medical graduates, family medicine residencies, whereas 40, I think, it was 47 percent. Uh, of internal medicine residencies were IMGs. So for U.S. graduates uh, or medical seniors, uh, you know, so it's a it's a better opportunity for you to get into family medicine. But I'm not 100% sure if we, as AC Medical, are going to continue to recommend family medicine as as the uh, as the best option, simply because the number of IMGs, if you're an international medical graduate and if you don't have U.S. visa, because the number of IMGs has been, uh, you know, it's almost been cut in half since about 10 years ago in this uh, specialty. So anyways, again, kind of digress, but family medicine is kind of going the same path as emergency medicine with a number of unfilled. So it will be interesting to see if, if the mentality of the program director changes a bit this year. Okay, indication of mentorship programs. I'm not sure what you mean by this. If you are here, Dr. M.M. I'm just gonna say your first name, Mariana. I'm not sure what that question means. So if you wanna raise your hand, then I'll be more than happy to um, to uh, speak with you. Let me see, we have a. Uh, we have a hand raised. Let's go ahead and uh, open the queue up. All right. So, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Oswald, yes, go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Oh, good afternoon, doctor. Good, good afternoon, afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My question, I actually wanted to piggyback on what you said about not waiving um, the right to view your LOR. I used to think that if you don't waive your right, it's more like a red flag to program director so i don't know so that's just my question it came to me as a shock hearing it from you so yeah sure no that's a great question let me go ahead and uh share my screen with you and and you know i'm i'm, I'm not making that recommendation to you lightly uh let me go ahead and uh, share with you a, a page where you could uh you could read more uh, about it so i'm going to take you to our website let's go to acmedical.org i'll take you to our academy page Let's take a look. I'm just going to type in um, LOR. Let me see where LOR resources comes in. All right, so LOR resources. So you go here to LOR resources, and we have a um, we have a hyperlink right down here, which is should I waive my right to see my letter of recommendation or not? And so I really want you to take a look at this and uh, and go through it. And there is you know reasons to not waive your right. There's reasons to waive your right. And and below it we have all of our recommendations. We have ten recommendations um and suggestions on what to do uh because of all of this so it's not you know it i, I summarized it for you that you should not waive your right and i still stand by it um i, I 100 stand by it that uh every every residency uh conference that i go to every program director conference that i go to um you know there's there's always a handful of, of program directors or selection committee members that are you know pretty die hard when it comes to uh waiving a letter of recommendation but majority of them don't care majority of them trust that the the person who owns the letter of recommendation who is the the letter writer that individual was was being sincere and uh, truthful when they drafted that letter of recommendation and so whether they waive the right to see for you to see the letter of recommendation or not is is irrelevant to them because 
there are so many other reasons why they would disqualify a candidate before it even gets a letter of recommendation, whether it was waived or not. For example, um, so in addition to this, we have this page, which is uh, which is 14 markers of a problematic residency candidate. And uh, I'm gonna, I, I really want you to take a look at this. So 14 uh, markers of a residency application. And so there are so many other issues that we can find in an application within seconds before we even get to your letters of recommendation. So waiving of an LOR or not is irrelevant. For example, if there's poor grammar, if there's poor grammar, uh, usage of unfamiliar terms, the writing styles was which mismatch in personal statement and when we when we in and, and other documents. You know, when we see all of these uh, inconsistencies, we're not even going to get to your letter of recommendation. You know, if if we if there is no commitment, there's no signs of commitment to a specialty. So let's say that all your letters are waived, and one of the letters of recommendation because you didn't see it and because you applied to two specialties says that you know I recommend you know him to internal medicine because you kind of had that conversation with him, and so and we're, I'm a family medicine program and I see that I'm done. It doesn't matter whether you waive your right or not. Uh, it's, you know, you're, you're not the right candidate for us. And I'm not saying you, but I'm just saying whoever this individual is. So there are so many factors that come in before waiving of a right that, um, that, you know, uh, waiving is just so low on, on the criteria list that it doesn't even, uh, you know, tip the needle. Uh, most of the letters, the problems with them is that they use generic sentences. So you could have a, a waived letter of recommendation that is, you know, that, that is three lines and, you know, half of a paragraph. Uh, you know, with a with a with a letterhead from Harvard, that that doesn't do anybody any good, whether it's waived or not. But had you seen that letter and you saw what that letter writer said about you, I bet you you wouldn't even use that letter of recommendation. So all of these, you know, are we're here to help you make sure that you're utilizing your your time and your budget correctly, not being uh, deceived by recommendations that uh, are really not even you're not even gonna uh, it's not gonna impact you because there's so many other issues that we got to deal with so you know we're on your side rather than you know we want to make sure that you uh get your application seen and so these are the things that that, that we recommend so hopefully you you found this beneficial i'm going to share this with all of you so that you can take a look at it as well thank you dr Mutani. my pleasure my pleasure of course thank you for asking that I can't tell you how many times I've seen a letter of recommendation that, uh, you know, that had misspellings in it. It was somebody else's letter of recommendation that was uploaded. Um, yeah, that happened. <laughs> that happened? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine you just spent $20,000 uh, with ERAS and you have a letter of recommendation that's uploaded that's not even yours, you know? Um, there's no way we're going to give that person an interview. Right, because we're going to think that it was your fault that you did it. But you know, lo and behold, it's it's the individual who uploaded it, which most of the time is not even the physician. It's a secretary or a medical assistant who may not even be there next month. So you know, we we can't let 20, 30 years of education come down to a. We can't give up control when it comes to letters of recommendation. They're so important. These letters are so important. You can't you can't give up control at that last you know the the twenty third hour. Okay, so let's see. And uh, yeah, what does it mean, uh, Dr. KR, uh, to waive a letter of recommendation? Uh, okay, again, again, we're going to have an entire webinar series on LORs, but to waive letter of recommendation means te theoretically you ask the physician to draft you a letter and um, you sent them a request from ERAS that says, you know, do you waive your right to see it or do you not waive your right? If you waive your right to see the letter of recommendation, means the letter writer doesn't have to give you a copy of the letter. Uh, if you do not waive your right, you can ask for a copy of the letter, but that doesn't uh, that doesn't you know, guarantee that you're going to get a copy of it. And and unfortunately, when you do not waive your right, that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to see the letter when it's uploaded. You will never see your letter of recommendation in the LOR portal. You'll never see it, which is also a major problem. I asked about that today uh, to ERAS, and they said that they they do not intend to change that at all. And you still are not going to be able to see your letter, even if you did not waive your right to see it. So that's what it means is that whether you have an idea about what's in the letter or do you not have any idea about what's in the letter. So that's what that means. Okay. And then Lady you had another question that you said, um, excuse me for how much it meant. Uh, I meant how 
much more beneficial to lower from in person rotation distance or lower than that. Some of the I say the lower from total rotations are worthless. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't accept, yeah, it's tougher to 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 draft tele rotation uh, letters of recommendation, but you know, there's uh, I, I can find an equal number of worthless in person letters of recommendation um, than I could with uh, with uh, with tele rotations. See, technology is here to stay. And if depending on how your telerotation was conducted, uh, you know, it makes a big difference about the quality and the content of that letter of recommendation. So again, that's what letter of recommendation analysis is for as a part of your membership. All right, so we're gonna start to wrap things up. Uh, let me just make sure there's no other major questions that I've left unanswered. Okay, great. Now, are any match trends IMG friendly? If so, how? You know, internal medicine continues to be, um, you know, I've, uh, again, I don't want to use the term IMG friendly. That doesn't mean that, you know, it's just, uh, I get it. I understand. It's, it's uh, yeah, what else can you call it, right? If they, if the number of IMGs are decreasing, what else can you call it? If they're, they're not friendly to IMG, but that doesn't mean that they're unfriendly to them. It just means that, you know, the, the, the you know, they may have like maybe one IMG in their program this year may, versus three, five years ago, right? Um, so they, they, their expectations have changed and uh doesn't make them any less or more friendly they just they're looking for you know different type of people that fit in maybe their community uh is is such that you know that uh it, it would it would it would be they would be less subject to ridicule if if somebody understands how to you know how to live in the deep south and versus somebody who's never lived in the united states before so it's not that they don't want to be friendly to you it's just maybe they, they're trying to make your life a lot easier too because they think look it's this is a tough neighborhood to be in and you know we haven't had luck with our doctors that have come from abroad and maybe all of them left uh, who knows what the reason is but you know i think if you apply across the country with the best application that you can and just have a good healthy budget for preparing your application and doing quality clinicals and having a proper mentor like ac medical to really walk you through every step and and keep you up to date with all the changes and then look at your application word by word very personalized, every letter, every PMSP, all of your documents. I think that makes a big, big difference. Then you can invest in your application. Uh, but IMG trends, I, I kind of mentioned emergency. I kind of mentioned family medicine to you. Um, you know, and uh, you know, and, and and it's actually a good topic to have as a as a series. Maybe we'll include that as a part of the ten steps to prepare. All right. Another question is: uh, I had my LOR personal statement, ERS application, supplement to ERS, and MSP greatly optimized. I applied to 170 surgery programs and a regular match and soap and offer 500 that are and soap that offer 500 plus positions but didn't receive this why did that happen you know we've uh, <clears throat> we've we've uh for, for all of you who who may find yourself in this situation look if you if you want to apply to surgery you need to have at least you know six to nine months of operating room experience in the united states you know two months is not enough and this was a conversation that i that i had uh with 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 this candidate and so i think you know you're, you're you're you you have a pretty good idea of why that happened it's just you know that was that was the wrong specialty i i i really didn't want you to apply to this specialty to begin with but who am i to say no so we move forward with it and you know you were committed and, and we did but um uh, but i'm i'm i think that you're changing your mind now and you're going to go for internal medicine this year but whenever any medical graduate from abroad comes and and says look i want to apply to surgery and if they didn't go to like a like a major Caribbean medical school, major, which means that they have uh, U.S. federal financial aid funding. You know, I always hesitate. Uh, I, I don't, I just don't, you know, there's, it's just so heart-wrenching uh, to, to go into surgery, uh, the application process. And, and, and most of the IMGs, they, they end up in, in, in preliminary positions. And it is, that's even more confusing afterwards. Anyways, we can have more conversations about surgery, but it is, it's a tough, tough road. One of our members got into surgery is now a prelim uh, surgery prelim pgy3 pgy3 prelim i've never seen that before in surgery but they just won't give him a categorical and he's just you know he he's not board eligible he's not he can't do anything every year he goes through the match surgery is tough surgery stuff really think about everything that uh, you're going to put yourself and your family through when you apply to these really tough specialties ophthalmology um surgery um um uh, uh, I don't know, uh, emergency medicine, even though they had so many unfilled, just just really think about everything that's involved. And again, I'm more than happy to have these discussions with you. I just I just think a lot of us underestimate 
who our number one competition is, and 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 it's really U.S. medical seniors. Okay, so uh, what is the best way to improve application with six months uh, remaining? Uh, just become a member fast, and and you know, become a member of AC Medical Residency Entry Membership. We are going to have a soap strategy session. We'll personalize how to deal with with your particular situation and and move forward. Um, anything short of that, it's just really hard to answer that question uh, because there's so many moving parts with every applicant. Uh, when should I ask to get letters of recommendation, and how many should I get from my regular medicine rotation? You should be asking, uh, well, it depends. If you're a medical graduate, you want to walk away with a letter of recommendation in hand, and you don't want your clinical experience to be any older than 12 months uh, before uh, the date of the letter of recommendation, no older than 12 months before residency, uh, well, before you you sub start submitting your application to programs, and you don't want the experience to be any older than 18 months. That's that's a rule of thumb. You know, if, if anything is from two years and older, you, you should not be using. Uh, so you want to have your clinical experiences recent this year in 2023. And, and you want to ask for your letters of recommendation. If you haven't done so, you want to ask for them now. The closer you get to August and September, the less the chances of you getting a letter because they're just absolutely overwhelmed with the number of requests. You're just don't be surprised if you don't get your letter of recommendation if you don't start working on it now. And then last question, it says, in context of postgrad IMGs, what's the best way to utilize the time between October 2023 and March 2024 after submitting the residency application in September 23? Uh, well, we at AC Medical, we prepare all of our uh, candidates who are of a membership that is residency entry or higher. We prepare their application as if they're not going to match. So we prepare their application with supplemental offer and acceptance program uh, in mind and incorporated into their ERAS application. Of course, ERAS is changing, so we have to see how we're gonna do that this year. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm gonna have a little asterisk on top of my uh, my recommendation right now, just to see what what my ERAS and what of the, uh, the worksheets, what does it look like? Uh, but generally speaking, you want to be in audition rotations between October, November, December, and maybe January. October, November, December, maybe January. And so what that does is, and you want to sign up for those and you want to lock those in before you certify your application. And then, and so that way we include those in your ERAS application and, 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 uh, and you don't have that additional gap. So you want to be in clinicals, um, you know, uh, research is not something that I would recommend. It's actually rated very low uh, in, in most of the specialties with regards to it being a factor for securing interviews. And so you want to be in clinical rotations. You want to be very doing similar things to what a U.S medical senior is doing and so that's what you want to do between uh, october and march you know february um in february you you got to be uh you know you got to be preparing for for soap anyways and so some some of our candidates we recommend clinicals at that point but but it, it all depends a couple of more questions uh let's see how much emergency medicine experience does one need to get into yeah a lot more than just experience uh dr ec you know you're but but you know you need to have four Technically, you want to have four LORs, uh, well, slows uh, from them, which is very hard for IMGs to secure. So uh, that has a lot to do with it. Uh, how many programs you apply to, how you interview, how much emergency medicine experience does one need? I, I mean, I wouldn't go any less than three really good emergency medicine experiences, three months uh, at a minimum, and that may not even be enough at a minimum. And, and it, because it depends on who are you going to get those letters from. So you may need to shoot for four. Uh, if you go for four letters of recommendation, then if one or two of them uh, back out or their letters are weak or they're, they don't give you a slow, then, you know, you have a backup option. But I'm not sure if, uh, if I'm still comfortable recommending anybody to, um, you know, to, to apply to like a medical graduate. If that's if you're strapped on cash, if you're very budget cautious and sensitive. I'm not sure if ER is the is the specialty I would recommend to you. I would much rather so you get into residency and then flex your muscles than than right now. I just I, it's just it's heart wrenching. It's so heartbreaking to see, you know, doctors just every year apply to the same specialty that is so challenging to get to, and they, it's just they, they, it becomes it it's it's really sad to do that. So depending on your particular situation, my my recommendation may change, but but I would love to know more about you. Let me see. Suppose you're still working to do USA experience to get a LOR. I'm not sure what that question is. Last question, is it possible to get into plastic surgery for an IMG? Uh, my friend, look, possible, sure. Is that what you want to do when you apply to the match and, and you have your entire family waiting for you and and you know your and and if there are any red flags in your application? I'm not sure if that's the wisest decision. 
you know, and this is coming from somebody who want, I wanted to be a, a trauma maxillofacial plastic surgeon. That was what I always wanted to do when I was a med student. I thought it was a cool thing to do, you know, but, you know, and then I, I ended up being a family physician. So, you know, you got to figure out what your priorities are and why you want to do certain things, you know, and, and is this the right time to, to, to flex your muscle the way that, that, you, uh, that you're trying to? I, I don't know all the dynamics in, in your family and your background and, and, you know, maybe you're a perfect plastic surgery candidate. I have no idea. But I certainly, that would not be my, I wouldn't jump right into that and say, sure, no problem. Let's go ahead and do it. I got plastic surgery rotations. We got plastic surgery rotation. That's not the issue. You're just, it's just going to be a tough, tough battle. I mean, that war is, is incredibly tough and, you know, and I just, I, I don't know. I wouldn't, that wouldn't be my recommendation right now. But statistically speaking, sure, sure. There are IMGs that match into plastic surgery. How do they do that? Uh, <laughs> Uh, quite, quite uh, different for each one and challenging. Okay, everyone. Well, I certainly appreciate everyone being here. It was uh, such a pleasure to to meet you all. And thank you so much for spending the time with us. Um, and please make sure that you register for our next uh, webinar series, uh, which is going to happen next week. And every week we're going to go ahead and update and add additional webinars to our webinars page. So please make sure that you sign up for them. And I look forward to seeing you all there. And if you miss any portion over here, you have additional questions, please make sure that you come to the YouTube world premiere of this exact same uh, webinar, which is going to be done, you know, in, in about a week or so. Uh, so thank you again. Good luck uh, with the 2024 match and see you on the next webinar series. Bye-bye.